It's the Profit Club. Watch our streams in fear. Ah, yeah. It's the Profit Club. The voice of God could be near. Sometimes we're right. Sometimes we're wrong. Just donate here and sing along. It's the Profit Club. All right, messing up pushing buttons, sitting in the car at the beach in uh, Kalapaki Bay, trying to do the uh, podcast, and uh, hopefully I got everything working right now that you can hear me. Let me look at the chat and make sure I'm back on. But, uh, yeah, um, I'll have internet this afternoon, but uh, not in time to do the stream. So we're uh, I'm on my phone, hanging on the AT&T signal, trying to get this done for you. And thanks you all for uh, showing up and uh, listening to what I have to say. And like I said, when I read Isaiah 64, I started doing my study. It, uh, yeah, the comfy car scene. This is, um, what do you call it? It just reminded me of the Prophet Club. That um, What's that saying in Ecclesiastes? What's been done before, be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Uh, same stuff they were dealing with back then, we're dealing with now. So... Like I said, we are going to be in Isaiah 64 in just a minute. But before we get there, I want to uh, take care of some business. Like I said, I have updated my mailing address to the uh, Lahui address on, on, the, on the cards. And it will be up there in the thing. Uh, the emails remain the same. Bill at discerningtruths.com. And any Profit Club emails, go to ProfitClubClowns clowns at gmail.com. And then I will post the uh, PDF of any slides I put up here on the Telegram room, the Discerning Truth Telegram room. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is no Neo programming this week, so I will not be on with her on Tuesday. But we will be here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, and like I said, I'll be broadcasting from the house uh, Wednesday and Friday. So uh, that'll all be cool. And... Uh, I, I wasn't up at 2.30 this morning to listen to Michael, <laughs> but uh, I did go back and uh, watch the uh, the replay from this morning's uh, episode. And, and what he's doing with Kings is just, God has really expanded his gift from just being a, uh, a storyteller with music to a storyteller explaining the Bible. And uh, I highly recommend that you tune in on... Uh, and then Sunday is lovely wife June, Linda joins them. So uh, from Sunday to Friday at 5.30 a.m. Pacific time, uh, 8.30 a.m. on the East Coast, uh, you can get Michael Beatty in Miguel California and uh, listen to his programs. And uh, if I wasn't inspired to do another Profit Club program already, Isaiah 64 uh, definitely pushed it on. So with that, let's get on with our study, you know. So, um, sorry, something haywire here. I just need a second. So I, I've been adding Matthew Henry's uh, introduction from his commentary. Uh, one, because I want to be consistent. Two, to show you how uh, somebody's theological grid can affect how they interpret scripture, because I think his theological grid didn't affect it. Okay, but it also he's a good quality commentator. I'm not trashing Matthew Henry. He's a solid commentator, well, uh, maybe one of the best out there that you can read. And uh, <clears throat> he still uh, lets his theology get in the way sometimes. So here's his introduction. This chapter goes on with that pathetic pleading prayer, which the church offered up to God in the latter part of the foregoing chapter. They had argued from their con uh, covenant relationship to God and his interest and concern in them. Now here I pray that God would appear in some remarkable and surprising manner for them against his and their enemies. In verse 1 and 2, they plead what God had formerly done in 
was always ready to do for his people in verses 3 and 5 and deserve judgments as they are now under in, in verses 6 and 7. They refer to themselves to the mercy of God the Father and submit themselves to his sovereignty. Verse 8, they re represent very deplorable condition they are in and earnestly pray for the uh, pardon of sin. It turning away God's anger. Verses 9 to 12, and this was not only intended for the use of the captive Jews, but may serve for direction to the church in other times of distress. What to ask God and how to plead with him? Are God's people at, the, at any time in affliction, in great affliction? Let them pray. Let them thus pray. So where I think he's wrong, as you can see, he immediately applied it to the church. But in the end of his chapter paragraph, he goes back that it applied to the Jews in their situation that they were in they were going into the Babylonian captivity Isaiah saw that in basically vision knew what was coming and is pleading for mercy but that has an application to the church because we are Israel in as much as Jesus is Israel and we are in Jesus okay so it applies to us and then you have the um understanding that you are to always pray when things get rough talking to god verses one to three say oh that you would rend the heavens and come down and the mountains might quake at your presence and when the fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known uh, to your adversaries and that the nations might tremble at your presence when you did awesome things that we did not look for. You came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. So it's only with our New Testament goggles that we can go back and see the Trinity in the Old Testament, like we saw in chapter 63. That overlap between the persons of the Trinity continues here. From Isaiah's perspective, it was the one and only God, Yahweh, who did all the miracles and wonders in the past, right? It, it is he who is coming to execute judgment. But we've already seen how many of these verses applied to the Son, right? And so this is a continuation of that prayer that Isaiah started, a beautiful prayer. I don't know what, um, when um, Matthew Henney is, is saying pathetic, it, 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 it's not saying that the prayer is pathetic. It's, it's prayed from a, a point of uh, being in a pathetic situation that we need God's help and uh, this is a continuation of that prayer it's pleading to God to come now right execute judgment take vengeance on the wicked the imagery here is end of days feel with the heavens being torn and God coming down mountains quaking uh, tremendous heat that is boiling water on contact and burning everything else up you can see the very apocalyptic type language that Isaiah is using. And I think that allows us easily to connect this to the end times, even though it will have application in history. <clears throat> because he's also connecting that language to what happened when they came out of Egypt. There weren't any mountains shaking. There wasn't stuff being burned up. Water wasn't boiling in God's presence. It's, it's hyperbole, it's apocalyptic language, and that's what it's intended to do is evoke an emotive response, right? Now, um, verses four and five, <clears throat> and I highlight, put part of this in a uh, yellow highlight for you, but everything here except for what I wrote in the white is part of the verse. The white's my note. It says, from of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear, no eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait for him you meet him who joyfully works righteousness those who remember you in your ways behold you were angry and we sinned and in our sins we have been a long time and shall shall we be saved so the first thing i'm pointing out here the esv that i copied out of capitalized god here there are no capitals in the original they're capitalizing god trying to indicate as god it's not this is talking about other gods. No eye has seen any god, a god, here beside you. There's no god beside um, Yahweh. That's clear in the Bible. There are other Elohim 
which we translate gods, but they are not gods by nature. They are created beings. And, and that's where we don't want to get into that Mormon error, thinking that they're all of the same class of being, right? Now, when he, I copied it out of the uh, Septuagint also, because I, I thought this, at least that first part, it says, we have not heard for eternity, or our eyes have not seen any God except you and your works, which you will do for those who wait for mercy. And I think the Septuagint, like I said, you will see me favor the Septuagint nine out of ten times over the Masoretic where they differ. I just think it's clearer a lot of times. Now, when you go into the New Testament, watch how Paul is going to pull parts of this verse out and paraphrase it, right? But he says what? But as it is written, and that then doesn't do an exact quote, at least not from the versions we have. He may be quoting from a version of the Septuagint that is slightly different than the version of the Septuagint that I'm reading from, right? They were not all the same. Uh, Jews treated everything, all the variations of their scripture as scripture, just like we would consider the King James and the NIV and the ESV and the NET all scripture you don't want to get fixated that only one is the correct version or only one you know this uh, King James only um, nonsense right and in 1st Corinthians 2 9 he says but as it is written what no eye has seen no or ear heard nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him so he's clearly alluding to this passage if not directly quoting it right and this is a continuation of prayer that's pleading with God to come now. Execute judgment. The heat that boils water on contact burns everything up. Isaiah professes an allegiance to the one and only God who has acted in the past. He acknowledges there Israel's sins and uh, basically asks, basic ally, basically, sorry, um, basically ask uh, if their punishment has has been long enough right you know it's a, yeah we were under sin a long time but isn't this enough they haven't even started their punishment okay the babylonian captivity has not even begun they're still dealing with assyria when isaiah writes this but he has seen in in his prophetic vision what's going to come in the babylonian captivity it is devastating it is devastating to the point that the jewish temple is going to be destroyed now, if you've been following along with Michael in 1 Kings, in 1 Kings, he promised Samuel, God promised, uh, not Samuel, Solomon, that if they continued to walk in his ways, that he would dwell with them forever. But if they didn't, he was going to blight them, blot them out, destroy the thing. He was going to make uh, them a, uh, uh, what do you call it, something to be detested by uh, those that are onlookers. If you built this amazing temple to the Lord and then because you followed other gods and because you didn't follow them and, and you walked in your own ways, God removes his presence from that temple and lets the Babylonian uh, king destroy it and, and peel it apart brick by brick, basically. You know, I mean, just just utterly destroy that temple and make it the laughing stock of the ages. Who's going to believe your God is the one most powerful God, right? But the God has shown the prophet Isaiah what's coming. And when God did it, he's, Isaiah is devastated. He's saying, oh my God, Lord, no, show mercy. Enough's enough. Don't do this. Don't let it go on. Can't you, uh, can't you show mercy? We are your people. Don't forget you did all these wonderful things for us in the past. That's this prayer. And then in verses 6 and 7, sorry. <coughs> it says, We've all become like the one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like the polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses themselves to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and have made us melt in the hand of your iniquity. Again, I'm going to... I quoted this in, in the Septuagint because I want you to see a little bit difference with the language. It says, especially what I have in yellow, all of our, unrighteous, our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. 
unclear. In the Septuagint it says, our righteousness is like the rag of a woman who sits apart. So Romans 3, 19 to 25, Paul makes the same argument about our righteousness being worthless. The English translators in most versions try to tone down the language, but here you can see it's from the Septuagint, the rag of the woman who sits apart. That separation is required for the law in Leviticus 15, 19 to 23 for a woman who's on her menstrual period. So the rag of this woman who sits apart is a menstrual rag. And that's, that's a graphic way that the Septuagint, and, and I believe Isaiah and Paul, are connecting our righteousness. If that doesn't get an emotive response to you, that level of hyperbole, I don't, I don't know what would. You can see that's intended to be there. It's not to be taken literally. Our righteousness are not literally some menstrual rag. It, it, it's, a, it's a metaphor. And it's a metaphor to evoke an emotive response of disgust at our own inability to produce righteous deeds. Right? That our righteousness is nothing. And, and to bring us on our face before God, the way Isaiah is on his face before God, pleading with him. Right? Now, verses 8 and 9, I got a lot to say about, so um, I, I needed five slides. It says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hands, but not so be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are your people. Okay? So, <clears throat> this idea... Of God being our father and us being God's children is is not new in Scripture but watch um, in in John 8 41 this is the conversation between Jews and Jesus and the Pharisees and he basically accuses them they accuse him of being a bastard child he's his rebuttal is to accuse them of being sons of their uh, the devil and their father and then their response is, we have one father, even God. So even even they, this, this is a common concept. They're not claiming to be biological offsprings of God. They're calling him father. It's a positional relationship. In 1 Peter 1.17, it says, And if you call upon him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. Again, so Peter is saying to them, if you if you're calling God Father, you need to uh, act like it, right? Now there are Christians that take passages like this literally, and teach what's called the serpent seed doctrine. And this is what got me on the Prophet Club issue when I was reading this, because I thought taking this passage literally, in that con that conversation between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees, where he calls them sons of the devil, and that they're uh, sons of their, um, not of Abraham, but of, of the devil, the father of lies. You're going to, uh, and they take that literally, and then they, they bring up all this anti-Semitic uh, nonsense of the serpent seed doctrine. And uh, I want you to understand, the serpent seed doctrine and British Israelism tend to go together. Okay? So when you start hearing these things, and, you're, and there's a lot of, being said like this on the internet right now this is not new and uh, but that um, C.A. L. Toten and uh, Russell Kelso Carter and Daniel Parker these are all British Israelites that preached this doctrine early and it became very popular among what are called primitive Baptists uh, primitive meaning early Baptists right and a Baptist was a separation, uh, moving a separation, be separate from the world and come out of the world. And the separatist movement in, in the uh, United States and Britain really is the, uh, the foundation for the Baptist church today. They don't connect them to the anti-Baptists of the Reformation. Anti-Baptists would be better connected to people like the Amish and Mennonites. Okay. And so, but this, Serpent seed teaching comes in several different forms. And I want you to pay attention to some of these names. William M. Branham, Arnold Murray, Wesley A. Swift, and Sung Young Moon. 
okay, all played important roles in spreading different versions of this doctrine among mem members of their respective groups throughout the 20th century. The basic idea here is that Satan literally had sex with Eve and produced Cain as a hybrid offspring. When Jesus calls the scribes and Pharisees sons of the devil, they take that phrase literally and claim that most modern day Jews aren't even fully human. Hear the anti-Semitism yet? I, I'm sure you can, you can see it in what's being done on here. The reason that the Serpent Seed Doctrine is often so closely related to British Israelism is that the two ideas feed into each other. If you're going to take the position that most modern Jews are actually descendants of Satan, then you need a new chosen people. Okay? Now you can do replacement theology like uh, Matthew Henry does where the church is the new Israel. Or what British Islamism does is say that uh, Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, that promises made to Manasseh seem to be fulfilled in the British Empire and promises made to Ephraim, the younger son who ends up being the greater of the two, are fulfilled in the United States. It's also, you can imagine this doctrine is very popular in Britain and the United States and not so much in India, for example, right? Because it promotes Britain and the United States as the promised land, right? Promoters of both theories employ this hyper-literal hermeneutic I've been refuting and railing against for 64 chapters now, okay? That this is nonsense. And this idea, the way the literal principle of biblical interpretation is currently being taught without being clarified and added caveats to it and all that stuff is produces this kind of hyper-literalism. And it produces all kinds of error in, the, in reading the Bible. All manner of error. And I've pushed other Christian apologists against it. And, and they, um, while they will come out and say, well, that's not really what it means. It means this. And, you know, I tell them, look, so I can't take the literal principle literally, right? Is that what you're telling me? It literally says this and there's a problem with it. You need to interpret scripture in the literary sense it was intended. And if it's clearly using hyperbole or apocalyptic language and symbolism and metaphor and simile you got to read it that way if it's reading as a historical narrative and and then you read it that way right if it's poetry you read it but i ask you to pay attention to some of the names because uh some of these names should be familiar with you william branham was a big fish figure in the modern pentecostal and charismatic movements he claimed to be a prophet with the anointing of elijah who had come to herald in Christ's second coming. He was regarded by many in, in the charismatic world as the final prophet to the church as claimed fulfillment of Malachi 4 or 5. Branham was quite influential in the heretical latter rain movement. And when we showed our connection between the latter rain movement and the new apostolic reformation, NAR, in the Prophet Club episode, I want you to see this connection. This guy who was teaching British Israelism, teaching the serpent seed, teaching uh, the latter rain, doing all that stuff, claiming for himself the uh, title of the final, uh, final prophet of God before the second coming. That's where this is coming from. Kenneth Hagin, Oral Roberts, Benny Hinn, others may call him a true prophet of God, but the clear verdict of scripture is he was one of the false prophets described in Jeremiah chapter 23. A man that teaches heresy on foundational doctrines of Christianity cannot be a prophet of God. Okay? Jesus said that false prophets would arise and deceive many. And he said that they would even deceive the elect if possible. Paul said that even the Antichrist will be accompanied by false signs and wonders. Right? John says that these are demonic spirits performing these signs. Follow this. These people that are teaching this are not your deceived brothers and sisters in Christ, although there may be people following them that are deceived. The people that are teaching this are being deceived by demonic spirits, and they're teaching absolute heresy. Now, Arnold Murray he used to be on the TV. He was one of those late-night TV guys, okay? 
we had a little church in uh, Arkansas, but a huge following on the, on the uh, uh, TV. Uh, he finally, he died uh, a few years ago in 2014. Not only did he teach the false doctrines of the serpent seed and Christian identity movement, uh, read Christian identity as white supremacy, okay? But he also taught heresies on the nature of God, a modalistic view of God. God put on different masks or operated that there's only one God and sometimes he acted as the son, sometimes he acted as the father, sometimes he acted as like God putting on different masks. Most of Arnold Murray's heretical teachings come from subtle misinterpretation of scripture. And this comes from uh, um, the Christian Research Institute on their equip.org, the second paragraph. I just took it right off of there because I thought they did a good job. It says, most of Arnold Murray's heretical teaching come from a subtle misinterpreting of scripture. He commonly manipulates the original Greek and Hebrew languages, abuses the symbols and numerics, interpret scripture out of context and makes use of selective citations by emphasizing to his audience that he has the correct almost secret meaning of the text that most scholars have ignored and overlooked murray can get a passage of scripture to mean almost anything he desires it to he claims that the majority of christians have been wrong from the beginning regarding their understanding of scripture and then they give you the source where they cited in his parable of the fig tree tape number 445. So again, you have a guy that teaches heresy in multiple areas, some on the nature of God. This is not he's teaching error on the timing of the second coming. He's teaching error on, on core Christian doctrines. His errors put him outside the circle of Christianity. Okay? may or may not be saved god can save whoever he feels like but i'm just telling you he's at that point where you're not even sure this is a christian he's definitely speaking doctrines of demons right and part of those doctrines of demons is the serpent seed idea okay now sung young moon uh many of you may know him taught that the bible could not be understood without the aid of his book called divine teaching we got more secret information for sale right according to moon a man is uh man is visible god and god is the invisible form of man in fact he crowned himself the king of peace okay these are the people that are big players in teaching this nonsense now you got small players that all have streams on the internet and think that they're now uh you know they were q experts for a while now they're theology experts and I don't think they knew what they were doing with either one. Okay? But pay attention to Moon here. He also claimed to be the Messiah and the Savior of the world. And his wife was the Holy Spirit. Moon's theology denies the Trinitarian understanding of the Godhead. Denies that Jesus was raised physically from the dead. That Jesus had a divine nature. And that Jesus delivered us from sin. So you may recognize a pattern by now with these false messiahs, false apostles, prophets, and teachers. They give for themselves and others around them titles of authority. They claim, they just self-appoint themselves as, I'm apostle so-and-so, or I'm prophet so-and-so, or like Moon claims to be the messiah, right? They claim to have secret knowledge, sometimes from an angel, or having gone to heaven, right? Maybe they went to heaven and God gave them a book off of the shelf, right? An extra book of... Uh, off the shelf of, of heaven. Or maybe they claim to have had a vision for an angel. Maybe they were dan dancing with Jesus in heaven. Whatever they did, they got some secret source of information outside of scripture. Right? They preach heresies and deviate from Christian orthodoxy in many areas. It's not just one problem. This is not somebody that is right on all these places, but teaches some weird things. Okay? They often perform signs and wonders trying to validate their false doctrines. Okay? The Bible tells you demons can do this. That spiritual powers, would, and demons I think as a collective here are not so much for as a uh, unique class of beings, but just talking about uh, spiritual beings who are in rebellion against God can uh, make these false signs and wonders. Do not be tricked by them. Do not be tricked by somebody who reads your mail and uh, 
it's a it's a phrase described to be able to tell you something about yourself like they're some kind of uh, uh, psychic and, they, and then they tell you about something and then claim to do healing even if a healing come takes place if that person is teaching false doctrine they are a false teacher and a false preacher and this is a false sign and wonder okay and I remember when my mom my mom had serious arthritis rheumatoid arthritis her fingers were all crooked my brother took her to somebody to get healed and my mom's prayer was God if this is from you let me be healed if it's not from you I don't want it it shouldn't that be all of our prayers if this healing is really from God please let it happen if it's not from God don't don't give me the healing I don't want it I don't want it from some demon right these people all take passages out of context they don't follow any sound hermeneutic and I've told you context 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 I'll repeat it until I'm blue in the face that's what we have to do they often claim another book is needed to understand scripture and they use unique translations to support their claim like the passion translation or the Joseph Smith translation or the new world translation of the Jehovah Witness okay they create translations that nobody else accepts okay that, are, that no Greek and Hebrew scholar thinks is, are valid and then they use them to support their thing or you'll see them do what I call uh, version shopping you will read somebody and when they're trying to make a point they quote from the King James here and the ESV here and the new NIV there and, the, and there you see them bounce and run you go well why are they not referring to one version regularly everybody's got their favorite version right you know I use the ESV because it's the version that Logos Bible software likes but I I like the King James I like the NAS uh, New American Standard I really like the notes in the NET Bible there's a number of Bibles that I would quote to if I was gonna write music or um, write poetry based on a Bible I'd probably go to the NIV because it flows better but those are if you're going to use those when they come up consistently if you're having to look for 20 different versions <clears throat> to find one that translated a verse that seems to support your position that's version shopping you're trying to back something up and you're, and you're picking versions to try to make it happen now the the way to react to that and that a lot of people react to that is with nonsense equally bad nonsense like the King James only people that like the King James is no comma, no period out of place. It's a perfect translation of the Bible. Not even the King James claimed that for itself. That I mean, this is ridiculous. And then uh, you, you get it. I was having a conversation with my brother today about there's passages that uh, in the King James are translated the faith of Jesus. And in uh, many of our other Bibles, it's faith in Jesus. Well, there's no word there in the Greek that's in or of in that phrase now there is a Greek word for in and the argument here is that if in is missing of is implied and that it has to do with the tense of faith in the in the Greek it's a technical argument but to me you have all these scholars that are fluent in Greek and they read it and they come up with the idea that in many cases uh, it faith in Jesus is correct in some places it's faith of Jesus some places it's the faithfulness of Jesus but he had one um, what do you call it scholar that had a different position right that was absolutely holding on to the place that um, it was um, what do you call it that because in was missing of belonged in the text and he was hanging on to that one scholar over there's over 60,000 scholars worked on the NET translation alone so 60,000 scholars disagree with this one scholar but of course that one scholar must be correct that's nonsense don't do this kind of stuff right so verses 10 and 12 said behold please look we are your people your holy cities have become a wilderness Zion has become a wilderness Jerusalem is a desolation our holy and beautiful house where have our fathers praised you 
has been burned by fire and all our pleasant places have become ruins. Will you restrain yourself from at these things? O oh Lord, will you keep silent and afflict us so terribly? So this Isaiah continuing with his, his prayer and his argument. And we, we're gonna, he's going to go back to the same tactic we saw in the last chapter where this prayer petition started. He's appealing to God not to let this happen because of his history with his people, with the Israelites. Um, they built, well, wow, almost almost built, built there. They built God a holy house in the temple. They praised God and made burnt offering stem in that temple. He was God to re He was God to remember those good things. Uh, he was asking God. Well, wow, just missing a word. He was asking God to remember those good things and show mercy. Sometimes the answer that uh, to even the most fervent prayers from God, the answer is no. And I think a lot of us expect it all always to be yes, right? And and we get upset when it's not yes. And if it's uh, not yes, then uh, we we need a new way to pray, right? We got to learn. Uh, someone will write a book and teach us how to pray better and ask in a certain uh, uh, method and get God to always say yes because you know they teach that we can declare and decree things to be the case and if we have enough faith that we can start telling God what to do. If you could tell God what to do, do you don't do don't you think Isaiah would have told him right here, right? This is, this is craziness. So. Back in my car, and if you uh, give me a minute, I'm gonna I'm gonna play another video. I think I might play another Prophet Club video, <laughs> and then I will uh, I'll be back and I'll read the chat and I'll be back and see you in just a minute, right? You know, so. Uh, Club, watch our streams in fear. Ah, oh, yeah, it's the Prophet Club. The voice of God could be near. Sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. Just donate here and sing along. It's the Prophet Club. Our mission is to both protect the members of the church, often referred to in scripture as sheep, from false prophets, false teachers, and to use scripture to provide correction, rebuke, and encourage the saints. In doing so, we will be honoring the command from Jesus to feed his sheep. Scripture warns us many times to beware of false prophets and teachers. In Scripture, Jesus, Paul, and the other apostles stood strong against the false prophets and teachers of their day. They called us to do the same. All right, I'm back. Yeah, I'm hoping you can see this connection to the to the Prophet Club of these people, and that they they just set themselves up to be uh, something more than they they are, and uh, self self appointed. And yeah, Lionel, I said a self appointed Archbishop of, of Awanga. Um, yeah, just make yourself up a title, write a book, claim to have talked to God. God told you. And, and this and that. And, and apparently it doesn't matter how many times you're wrong, right? That you can keep going out there. If, if you just sound nice and you don't be mean about it and you sound wonderful and, and tell stories that nobody can verify or, or falsify, you go out there and uh, and make yourself a ton of money doing this stuff. Or you can be like Isaiah and put yourself on your face before God in repentance and, and, and just feeling bad for what we 
as, as a people, what I as a person, what you as, as, as a person have done that have not lived up to what God expects us to be. And we have all failed. All men have fall, uh, fallen short of the glory of God, right? We all do this. And so he understood that. He understood there's consequences. But I told you, uh, I mentioned last week, and, and, I, and it came up here a little bit today. Um, the Ark of the Covenant was taken out of <clears throat> the temple in, in Jerusalem before King Nebuchadnezzar sacked it. So it never got taken to Babylon. It wasn't there. Um, you, you'd have to read Maccabees, which is not in many of your proper uh, uh, Protestant Bibles. But it, it's there. The Jeremiah went off and hid it in a mountain. And it, it's been there. But there's the Ark of the Covenant has been gone. So when Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, <laughs> Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple after the Babylonian captivity, and then they started doing sacrifices in, in that, every year at the Day of Atonement, they're supposed to sacrifice a, a sheep or a goat, and they go put the blood of that sheep or the goat on the mercy seat behind the veil. Only the high priest enters in there. And they, they have all these, um, what do you call it, uh, traditions in that, like they put bells on the garment of the priest in case when he goes in there, God doesn't accept the offering and kills them, uh, that they can hear the bells will stop ringing. And they tie a, a rope to his ankle so that they could drag him back out on the other side, his dead body back out if God rejects his offering. So there was no ark in there. There's no um, nothing. It's an empty room behind the, the curtain. So my question is, from 516 BC until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, what were the Jews doing on the Day of Atonement? Was this all a show like the Wizard of Oz? Don't look behind the curtain. You know, what was going on there? And I thought I'd look into that on, for Friday. That might be a fun subject because uh, they definitely were not placing blood on any uh, mercy seat because the ark wasn't there. And when when Jesus ripped the ark or ripped the curtain uh, at his death, it was torn from top to bottom. I've always been told that that was to remove the separation between man and God, and we now had access to God. But when you understand that there's no ark there, it, it gave us access to an empty room. What does that mean? Or did Jesus rip the veil to to uh, take away the hiding of the religious spirit and the religious uh, charade that had been going on for uh, over 500 years? It's an interesting thought, just something that uh, if you want to hang out with me on, on Friday, we're going to take a uh, take a look at that question. But um, it's funny that you see these things. You know, Isaiah predicts things, and then Michael's doing Kings, and especially Second Kings, but partly here in First Kings, you're seeing the fulfillment of Isaiah's predictions, right? Then you see it. Uh, how the New Testament writers take what Isaiah says and uh, repurpose it for to make theological statements. And then you have uh, John repurposing him again for the end times. And it all works together. It's like a little, um, the strands in, in the weaving of a basket. And you follow the strands, you can see how they all connect together. So with that, I'm going to close a little early, land this plane, and... Uh, just get out of here and uh, I'm going to see you on Wednesday. And from then, I, I should be broadcasting from the house. And God bless you all. And uh, I'll do, uh, see you again.
down one.